some, uh, some more admirals, engineers, and historians. I say revised because, well, I had an original version, which was two introductions, which I had recorded yesterday. Well, actually, I'd recorded one on Saturday and one yesterday. And was planning to go live at midnight and six and about 9am today. And I stopped them. Because all day yesterday I decided, I was looking at the events going on in the world. The debates have been happening Sunday, Monday and... I wanted to change it. And the great thing is, whilst I do broadly treat these like a sort of long-term naval history course sort of thing, where I'm carrying on areas and going back and filling in gaps and then moving on and going back and filling in gaps and moving on sort of thing, I can also teach uh, treat this kind of like when I go and do a guest lecture. And when I do a guest lecture, I tend to get, well, it depends, it's one thing. If I'm part of a, if I'm turning up to do a lecture as part of a course, then I have a, then I have a topic and I have to cover that, so that's fine. But if I've just been given a title and asked to come and give a talk on leadership or this or that, well, I can sort of adapt that pretty much any way I want. Hence, I once scared my former school, when they asked me to come back again and talk on leadership and they were expecting one to be all about naval and military affairs and actually what I provided them with was a lovely talk which did include a couple of military leaders examples but also included politicians, celebrities and people with the X factor in terms of leadership. Mainly because that was the way to the end. Okay. And it, get, it helped me breach the audience and got me invited back again, actually, for other talks. But leaving that to one side, it means that I can adapt things. And especially while I was recording, when I went back and looked through the videos before they aired and checking them, six of the subjects really struck out, and I thought I would rather re-emphasize them as one bigger interview, one bigger video and have that as the introduction and topic for today's discussion, rather than have all 12. So, secondly, what do you think of my new Roundel? <laughs> Drac made it for me. Um, he's the, uh, uh, One of the great things about being friends with Drac is he chats away a lot and he's advised me a lot on how to build the channel and how to do is make things sort of better and improve things and is always there actually as a very very calming reassuring friendly voice when i'm having technical issues because whilst i did used to be an it technician uh during my bachelor's believe it or not having got a phd and been a contract lecturer for now for a good few years that was about 12 or so years ago. So I'm a deck. Despite myself having kept very, kept my skills up when it comes to building PCs and building gaming computers, which is what my computer normally is um, when I have my PC set up, uh, I built it myself. Uh, there is a whole different world game with what's going on online in terms of tools and how you develop things. Anyway, that's the new roundel. We hope Iron Brew won't sue us. Well, me. I won't give up track. I'll be nice. But... Anyway, without much further ado... Now, this was the original plan. The original plan was the ones who I'm going to discuss and... Ancient Bilge Pumps, of course. 
Oh, oh I love those ones. It's way too much fun. I've got to get bumps. So this is on the clock. What might have been? Admiral Stefan Makhanov, Professor Eric Gove, Alexei Kirlov, who I consider the um, Russian Admiral version of Drakenfinal. He really is. Everything he writes comes down to the application of mathematics to various maritime problems. He's just such a engineer's engineer. Amory Sunsin. Professor Harry Barrett and Norman the Godfather of Modern Naval History Freeman. Yeah, they were going to be six very fun ones, and I promised to do them again some other day as their own video and, you know, when they are appropriate. And they will be done. But this is a new one. This is what we're doing now, and this is the new. So, without much further ado, and realizing that I do need to speak as loudly as possible, and I can do that this time, Admiral Hyman G. Rick Rover, and my God, has that quote come out, those quotes come out small. He is the Fab Nuclear Navy. He is possibly one of the most controversial of the admirals to be considered. Right now. Not sure what happened there. Admiral Hyman G. Rick over. Ah, the thing appears to have reset the pictures quickly. I don't know. But anyway. So Rick Rover is a very very interesting gentleman and i will have a link to this down below um he's a very interesting gentleman because he's the father of the nuclear navy but he's not just the father of the nuclear navy he's also the father of the idea that you just build the perfect ships you build the biggest and best ships so the modern U.S. Navy can be said to be very much attributable to him, or rather the current U.S. Navy. He was very popular with Congress and was very good at balancing his constructions, so they made senators very happy, i.e. they included lots of states. He was also very much a fan of trying to deter war, and he viewed deterrence of war as relying on having the biggest possible stick to walk around with. Interesting thing is, possibly he's not... A, the, tr the trouble with Rick Rover is that As well as being the father in terms of not nuclear power, but also building the best and only building the best, he made it very, very difficult for the U.S. Navy to build something else, for the U.S. Navy to have a good enough class. And in fact, you could almost say that he made it in very he made all the issues with the current LCS and the FFGX and all the other problems that the US Navy is currently having in its lower end vessels happen because of Rick Rover's constant pushing and constant demands and constant stressing of the need for a more powerful ships, for the perfect ships, for the best ships. I've got two quotes from page 13 of this very interesting Carnegie sort of interview with him. Um, and there is a link down below to it to go look through. And I want him looked at as he is. He is a very powerful, very present gentleman in his period. He's not necessary. He's not the best personality you're getting on with. And frankly... I think he's to say he, he comes from a school of thought which is that the Royal Navy should have sent more battleships to Singapore 
uh, rather than not have sent the battleship to Singapore. Because he's very obsessed with the very big, very best. And that is all you build. He actively campaigns against other ships. He actively campaigns against anything which isn't expressly seeking to be the best. Again, it's rather interesting that considering what happened to them, that the Zumwalt class is named for Zumwalt, and yet what happened to them is a classic example of what Rick Rover would have done. Because Rick Rover would have made, okay, we're building a super self-destroyer, well, right, we've also got to put on a new VLS, we've put in new electronics, we've also got to put in a new railgun. Even though the railgun's not going to be ready on time, and if it doesn't work, that could make the whole ship terrible, uh, look, look bad. We've got to do that, because it's got to be the best of the best. We'll get into Zumwalt later, you know, the, the, there is a difference there. So... <sighs> But you can also see where he gets his ideas from. His ideas come from a very simple application of what Theodore Roosevelt was trying, of what all the Roosevelts tried before, you know, prior to World War One, prior to World War Two. The idea that you could build up the behind of the Navy and that would deter conflict alone. And there is an argument for that because if you don't build the high end of the Navy in peacetime, the odds are you won't have the time to build it in wartime. Even if your war lasts six or so years. <laughs> we'll just look at the Royal Navy. What it starts the war with and under construction is pretty much what it's still fighting the war with at the end. The US Navy, again, a large proportion of what actually comes into service in World War II is what was started before or ordered or worked out before World War II, especially in terms of what was planned, what's actually constructed. And that's even with a service which is expanding the yards massively. Zheng He. Okay, myth versus reality. Whenever I'm discussing Admiral Zheng He, the first thing that often comes up is this Confucian ideal of him being a peaceful diplomat who's going around the world and just exploring. No. And that's doing him a disservice. It's nowhere near that simple. These are massive expeditions. Absolutely colossal expeditions. There's been all sorts of arguments done to push him down to say no, he wouldn't have taken the full-sized treasure ships, he'd have just taken the smaller ones to sea and all sorts of things, six flag six masted ones rather than the nine masts and all these things. I'm fairly sure he probably did take at least a couple of the large ones to sea. Nicest way, there is a simple reason for this. We talk about the Vikings going a Viking, and actually, and that's what the, that's where we get the phrase Viking from. And those are basically large armed raids. Well, this is not a large armed raid. This is a Corbettian, Mahanian almost presence mission before those two are even conce conceived, yet even thought about. This is him going, uh, this is the Chinese emperor sending out a very trusted aid, more of a, so much a diplomat as anything, out with a large fleet of soldiers, of sailors, we're talking tens of thousands of, of personnel, to sail around well-known routes where there are Chinese communities to deal with piracy, to deal with local rulers who might not be being as nice to those communities as they need to be, to deal with the local community, the Chinese communities to make sure they remember who is the emperor. All sorts of missions need to be done. And they went a long way. Again, they didn't go around the world, but they did go a very long way. And there is certain rumours of them getting to the west coast of Africa. I wouldn't be surprised. 
We definitely know they got to the Horn of Africa, but I wouldn't be surprised if, they, if a couple of them went south. They were, at, to an extent, explorers, yes, but also they are looking at the traditional trade routes. They are going the traditional trade routes. And they know where they're going. They know what they're doing. Uh, the biggest disappointment, I think, with the Zheng He voyages with, with them all is that Wang Jingong, his deputy, finally gets to command one. We're not sure whether Zheng He dies or retires. Finally gets, and he gets shipwrecked. He's been his deputy on every other voyage. Finally gets to command one and dies. It's just cruel. It's fake being cruel to him. Anyway, which is why he's almost completely forgotten, and Zheng He is, and I call him an admiral here, but really he's not. Um, he's more uh, the highest rank of eunuch you could have in the court. And yes, that does mean exactly what you think it means. But there are seven or so eunuchs of that rank in these missions, including um, Wang Jiong, and there are 10 or so next rank down, and there are about 70 or so eunuchs overall in the force. The force also contains two what we would roughly translate as brigadiers in each in command of thousands of troops, all sorts of sailors, specialists, diplomats, everything you can imagine. It is a armada. And that is why I've picked the Duke of Medina Sidonia. He's far more a senior manager of a huge enterprise going forward than anything more. It'd be more... I don't know how to describe it. Like the, It would be like in the later imperial period of Britain, of the Viceroy of India leading an expedition. This is what you've got to sort of go. Not so much a general as a governor, as a, you know, the highest representative of the government that can be sent of the emperor coming out. It's, it's that powerful, it's that personal, but it's also there. And it's, it's amazing. But it's not necessarily famous in the right way. There is a lot of myth which goes around it, which is being used for uh, the current Japanese, uh, current Chinese Navy. The Japanese Navy, we'll leave that to one side. Um, the, Ch uh, the Chinese Navy use it as an example of the peaceful, um, you know, Navy's presence. This wasn't peaceful. They had battles. They did full-on fighting. There was really nothing peaceful about 20-odd thousand soldiers turning up on your doorstep in this period. That's a huge army. You know, for most of these periods, that is a huge, huge army. Uh, there is... A sort of rumour that at one point they might have ended up fighting the Eastern Roman Empire, but I'm not really quite sure about that. All these things are, they are very big, very present, very there. And they are colossal ships as well. There is a whole debate on how big they were, but the one thing I would say is that there is rumor, there is some truth, I think, in that they were probably bigger than Atrium's victory. So just think about that. Nine masts, they use concrete and all sorts of things in their construction. It's very technical, very advanced for its time period. Very, very survival. Again, I'm not that sure if I would take the bigger ones down to the Cape of Good Hope, but there are smaller ones. There's a whole range of sizes which go with the fleet. It's not all made up of the great treasure ships, as they're called. It is also made up of a large number of smaller ships. Which are carrying horses and all sorts of things and water and all sorts of things for the soldiers. So this is a massive military expedition. And it does set up garrisons as well. 
in certain areas to deal with the piracy threat, to deal with local rulers. All sorts of little fun things. It gets up to a huge number of things. But it is more a securing of existing trade routes rather than exploration. Now, Admiral of the Fleet of the Soviet Union, S.G. Gorshkov. Now, he is also as much a politician as an admiral, and this is his book, Sea Power of State, and this is what my quotes are from. I find him an interesting officer, and he is one who can certainly cherry pick, but knows when to play to myths in terms of Soviet history and um, all sorts of things. Now, and he is a very, very interesting officer. This is a very, very thick quote. Now, I find the bottom quote the most fun because it comes from page 260. And pretty much it makes the case that the reason the Battle of the Atlantic was won was because Germany invaded um, the Soviet Union. It's rather an interesting point, but okay, let's start off with the stats. So 787 ships with a total tonnage of 2.8 million is, well, 787 ships with a total tonnage of 2.83 million, let's say roughly, is roughly about 3,600 gross tons per ship. Which is about acceptable. However, when we take a figure which is in a sort of average, one three seven five thousand divided by two hundred and seventy six, we get an average figure which is not far short of five thousand gross tons. So the ships have all managed to grow on average. So somehow the beginning of the war. Germany is killing three times as many ships almost, but they're all smaller on average. And um, yes, they're still killing less ships, but. It, mm. Now, here's the thing. At the time, Gorshkov was making the case for nuclear submarines, for basically building the modern Soviet Navy. And you have to remember this. This is part of his argument that actually, you know, the Germans could have won the war against the British if they concentrated all their efforts against it rather than, you know, fighting a land battle as well. Now, you know, therefore, using submarines, I could, strong, uh, I could strangle NATO by cutting them off from their biggest partner and um, make the war eminently winnable without resort to nuclear weapons. There's some problems with those facts. We'll just consider them as others. One, the Royal Navy was building a huge number of escorts, and they were starting to have an effect pretty much by that point, uh, the, uh, the, the first half of 1941. In fact, before that. Also, that he's talking about the whole evolution of the war, and if the losses of U-boats, uh, losses to U-boats in 1941 had been, how do I put it, so critical, and they were pretty nicely, there is a problem with the fact that the British are continuing on, and the British did continue on quite well. Managed to go through this already. Now, the fact is... <sighs> It becomes quite complicated when you're looking at it from a pure submarine perspective. You have to remember that in this period, the British were also adapting to war in the Mediterranean, to reorganizing their forces around the world, and all sorts of factors going on, which is left out of this analysis. This is very much using a myth, because it's not going to get cross-examined by his Soviet audience because of the great patriotic war myth that's gone around. And the myth is that basically the Soviet Union defeated the Germans entirely on their own. And that 
might get me into trouble because they do do a major part of it. They are a major component in the war, but they do not fight it alone. They do not win it solo. As much as they might sometimes like to claim that. Uh, he also goes in for naval diplomacy, and demonstrating actions by the fleet in many cases have made it possible to achieve political ends without resorting to armed struggle. Merely by putting a, a, on pressure with one's own potential might and threatening to start military operations. He does get into this. He's actually, it's kind of interesting because his book splits between a use of myth almost to make it impossible for anyone to critique the internally. And that's the internal, you must remember, it's, this book is made for the internal market. It is published externally, but it's made for the internal market. To, uh, to critique the construction of the Soviet Navy. He's strengthening that to political grounds. And there's a reason it comes out in 1976. And if you consider that 20 years into his tenure as Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Navy, and he'll have another... Ten, this book basically buys him another 10 years. Okay? So he's had 20 years. He's He, he, he has survived... Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Andropov, and he will survive uh, for quite a long time under Shcherbakov. Uh, um, he is very, very powerful, but he has to keep that position to in order to deliver the things he needs to do. So he needs to be able to promise them peacetime. I can give you the influence and diplomacy around the world, and I have to give it to you in a strong way. I can't emphasize the more nuance naval diplomacy and options i have to give you a strong one wartime i have to tell make it very very obvious what we can do but i also have to make this to the point of in wartime that the soviet and that the army cannot completely write me off i have to make it so that the army has to agree and actually by saying this that the only reason the british were able to start winning the war of the Battle of the Atlantic was because the Soviet army was absorbing all the strength of the German, Nazi Germany. That is a great thing because the Soviet army can't say we weren't. They weren't aren't going to turn and go, oh no, the, Soviet, uh, the Germans weren't throwing all their might at us. They won't. They can't. Because that's their creation myth. That's their great claim to fame. So they have to agree that Gorshkov is right. That they were the saviour of Britain and the Battle of the Atlantic. But that means if they agree with his point there, they can't disagree with his point that if the Germans had been concentrating their efforts on the Battle of the Atlantic, the Germans could have won the Battle of the Atlantic. This is some good politics going on, and it's how he can get his ships built. And also, what I love is it's hidden at page 260 in this book. And it's there because if you skim read the book, you might miss it. And then you might start quote, trying to attack him on it, and he can bring it up, and you will look at this is a man who has been playing the Soviet system for all his life. By now has been at its nearly its top for 20 odd years. He is a master of politics. Possibly not of fleet construction, but definitely of politics. And he has a lot of medals. That is a, 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 a lot of scrambled eggs there going on there. Right, Zumwalt. It's not fair to look at Rick Rover without looking at Zumwalt, the guy who locked hordes with him on a regular basis. Mainly because I prefer Zumwalt. Zumwalt had Desron 26, which was this idea that you could have some uh, top of the line destroyers take them out and put them under the command of officers who were a rank below what they normally be to try out young officers, good young officers, with command as early as possible, to test their abilities, to promote them, to see what you could do. And it was excellent. 
not always successful, but it was excellent opportunities. And it's uh, interesting enough, the commanders who served in those ships have gone on to fairly good things with the US Navy since. The Hilo Fleet Mix. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be seeing again. I keep talking about this re recently, so I'm probably going to have to do a video about it at some point. The Sea Control Ship, because I can't keep inducing PTSD in a certain generation of US Navy officer without actually going the full hog on it. I'm sorry, I shouldn't make that joke, but it, it's true. Um, if you ever mention the sea control ship to a certain generation of US Navy, so they start doing this. Involuntary ticks and things come on, because it was such a saga. Um, and it was so painful for the US Navy. But he also gets the Pegasus class Hydrofoils and the other has a Perry class frigates. Which are, let's be honest, the Pegasus aren't, the hun full hundred aren't built, which is a shame because they do cool. Um, but the Holliver has a Perry class frigates were until the Arleigh Burks reached, I think it's Flight 2A, halfway through, um, were the most numerous. US Navy ships built post Second World War and they were critical. Finally, there are the Zgrams. These are telegrams from Zumwalt and they're his attempts to fix the Navy. There are oodles and oodles of them, and the great thing about the Wikipedia page is it lists all of them, and I love them. But I've picked out the four which mean uh, I find the most interesting. And they're all to do with education. Establishes a command excellence share at the Naval War College to be filled by a commander or captain with a record of outstanding performance in command. You'd expect that to have already existed, but it didn't. So he did. 49. Required a half of personnel on awards boards to be below the rank of commander. He wanted officers going and he wanted officers and ratings to be examined fairly. And he wanted people to be looked at fairly. He didn't want awards just going to make people's mates. So there are going 59. Established a program for officers to spend a year of independent research and study for professional development in areas mutually beneficial to the officer and the Navy. You think about how critical that is to this day. I know many US Navy officers who have benefited from programs which that one and from ones which have come after based off that one. It was put in not only for to help with the professional development of officers but also to help with their family lives. It could give them a year of relative peace and minimal movement. And it established a Naval War College forum to discuss improved naval personnel policies and present their views to CNO and the Secretary of Navy. He wanted to improve a lot for sailors and for officers and for everyone in the Navy. Now, the interesting thing, the high-low fleet mix, you can honestly say, he loses. So, uh, it's Rick Rover whose ideas for how to build a fleet dominate. It's Rick Rovers whose concentration on perfection wins out. But does it? Because he start, his building is a generation of officers. Rick Rover wins at a time. And yes, there was a sea control ship, so that's not really the best idea. But the trouble is, the officers who've come through... Rick Rover won with the battle for ships at the time and building the US Navy of the time, and I would say for much of the up to the into the 1990s. But there is a good strong argument that Zumwalt has won the longer battle because Zumwalt concentrated on education of officers and sailors. And Zumwalt the Navy that's now being built, if you look at FFGX, if you look at some of the programs being discussed by the US Marine Corps with their amphibious ships, if you look at all the things going on, it is very much a high-low mix starting to come through.
So yes, Zumwalt lost the short-term battle for the U.S. Navy in terms of its its construction with Rick Rover. He won with the Oliver Hampton Perry, but lost with the battle overall. But more importantly, he won the battle for the soul of the U.S. Navy. And I have a feeling the sort of the U.S. Navy, as it will come into service in the next few decades, the next couple of decades, will be far more a reflection of Zumwalt than it will of Rick Rover. I also have a feeling that if Zumwalt had actually been in charge while the Zumwalt class was being built, he would have gone, what's the highest risk part of this project? Uh, the rail guns. Right then, they will be fitted on in next phase. We'll just go with an extended gun system, um, uh, advanced gun system, the, whatever's, you know, the most advanced conventional system we can put on there. So the ships themselves would be a high-low mix. We then might have more Zumwalts in the service. He also might have fixed the facial expression on them. Anyone might have fixed the facial expression if they'd actually looked at pictures of the front of them when they were being designed. Someone needed to have done it. Right now. Wu Sheng Li. So we talked about the mythical founder of the modern Chinese Navy, Admiral Zheng He. Well, here's the real founder of the Chinese Navy. As I would consider it. Because I would say the... Wu Sheng Li comes to power in 2006, and while Zhang Dingfa had achieved a lot, Wu Sheng Li managed to deliver these things and get them through. Interesting enough, he doesn't make it, and again, the link is down below, he doesn't make it to higher fleet command. Well, he he's, makes it to command of the the Chinese Navy, he is the commander of the Chinese Navy, he doesn't make it to higher political posts, he doesn't become a deputy defence minister or anything like that. Some people expect him to, but honestly, I didn't. Because he proved very, very powerful, and the People's Liberation Army would have been very worried about how much power the Navy would have got if he got any higher. He is the architect which we see most of the modern Chinese Navy based around, in terms of what's come through. And I say this not just from this report, but I say this from other readings I've and discussions I've had over him over years, and stuff which I now couldn't find links to because it disappears. It gets even worse when I get to the next admiral, when stuff just disappears. The information available about them disappears. There's actually more about Wu Sheng Li than there is about the next one. But there isn't as much talked about when it comes to this one, this gentleman. And I think that's a problem, because we treat admirals and theorists as something which happened a long time ago, or happened in the past. Well, he has retired now. Um, he's no longer in post, he's been succeeded. So he is technically history. Might be only a couple of years ago, but it's still history, it's in the past. And you should be. we should be studying him to see where the Chinese Navy is really going. And if you look at him... And if you look at what he was emphasizing, um, surface action groups to dominate the South China Sea, islands, a couple of carriers, it all sort of starts to make sense in terms of its formation. But what really is interesting is in terms of what he's looking at for geo strategic role of the fleet in peacetime in deterrence. And it comes down to, I wouldn't be surprised if he's using this as his guide. Far more than saying he. I'm not saying he's only going off this, and I'm not saying he's copying ideas. He certainly didn't. But I, this, I would say, is far more influential in terms of his growth and in terms of the way the Chinese Navy has grown and been guided by under his tenure than the myth of Zheng He.
That is very, very useful cultural, national, and naval propaganda. Right then, here is the most difficult to find anything about. He commanded the Russian Navy for five years. He's Admiral Vladimir Bistoksi. That's the Gorshka class, mostly built under his tenure. He is an enigma, as are most Russian Navy commanders these days. Their interviews, their details about them disappear quickly from the uh, uh, quickly from the internet. I tried tracking down the Russian language. My very lovely girlfriend tried tracking down the Russian language because she speaks Russian far better than I managed to read it. And what's funny is I had article links I'd saved about him over the years because I used to teach about him in. 2012, I was doing some discussion about him. Those links have all deactivated, and I, when I went back onto the Wayback Machines and various others, they weren't there. He is a very powerful figure. Well, he certainly was. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if he's still alive. I think he is, but um, the U. Uh, but the modern Russian Navy owes itself may massively to him. And conversely, he seems to be the least interested in this guy. No, he is far more. Can I find my book? I had it here yesterday. Because I was using it. Um, no, I can't now find my book. That's helpful. He is far more this star. He is far more, and they were far more influenced in many ways by Corbett at the time, and Corbettian philosophy. He is far more about naval diplomacy, about building ships which will have a big impact for magnifying your national status around the world and your presence around the world, which is why he concentrated on his figures, he, which is why he was talking about possibly buying foreign-made vessels, because, frankly, it was a pragmatic approach. If we can't build it, we still need the vessels to have the presence around the world. What matters is the presence more than where the vessels are built. So it starts off the Mistral class, and that's the saga, and that's why we've got the Russian LHDs, which are going to be coming into service at some point. This is a very pragmatic commander, a very pragmatic about the realities of the Russian situation and the Russian funding. He and his successors, especially his protégés, who I think one of his protégés is now actually the new Russian Navy commander, mm -hmm. or relatively new Russian Navy commander, are not to be written off, but they aren't known enough about. Not public anyway. Hopefully, intelligence services, etc. know far more. So, what have we got? Well, we've got today some more admirals, engineers, and historians. Um, Thursday, we have naval diplomacy. Uh, then we have the Patreon video on Monday, uh, which is Indian Ocean from 1941 to 43. Then we have from the sea, 23rd of July, Korea, Indonesian confrontation, and I'm thinking about adding in a third or a fourth, and a fourth one, probably going to be a third one, but I'm still debating over the final one. Um, perhaps if you have any ideas of from the sea naval interventions in land conflicts other than the Falklands War, um, that'd be kind of interesting, see what was suggested. Uh, 20th of July, making Mario Nostrum a hollow jest. If I do nick someone's idea, I will give them good due credit. And 3rd of July, pre-tribals. Yay! Then we have August. Right then, August I've had to divide between two slides because we have Tony Penfolds, The Little Boat Wars, on Monday the 3rd of August. Then we have Thursday 6th of August, The Outcome of the Spanish Armada. 11th of August, The Battle of Cape Pasaro, a battle without a war. Thursday the 13th, or, um, HMS Emerald and HMS Enterprise. 
Oh, and hands up how many of you have heard of the Battle of Cape Basara before? I used to always teach the kings, but the amount that no one would know about it before I taught them. I'm hoping, that, I, I'm wondering if my viewers are slightly more um, history buffs than my students were then. Uh, Monday 17th, um, Petra Video 4, courtesy of Dana Freeman. What if Singtao incident goes hot and Model 2 begins in January 1939? It's a rather interesting scenario. Does Hitler declare war on Britain in sympathy with his Japanese allies in January 1939? He didn't want a war that early. But he does in 1914, does declare war on the USA when Japan attacks America. But that's in 1941. Might he think actually that a distracted Britain is far better than fighting Britain at this point, with Britain moving all the resources to the Far East? It's an interesting question. What will the Americans do? And that's the other thing. If the Americans are really coming on the side of the British, and you suddenly got this grand coalition, it's, it's all an interesting idea. So it's going to be an interesting counterfactual history. Examination. To, you know, to try and think about the things that play out. 20th, the Battle of Texel, the problem of depending upon allies. Yeah, it's the Anglo-French versus the Dutch. And the French of all does not fight. Um, could be useful for remembering when we're doing current things like our strategic, uh, like the um, defense reviews. 25th, uh, could Crete have been saved in 1941? Those are 27th, the convoy war and perfect storm of PQ-17. And 31st of, uh, Monday 31st, patron vi uh, video number 5, courtesy of Bail and Nora, Mediterranean gunboat diplomacy in Victorian era. Interesting enough, because I've shifted some um, to Mondays, I can actually fit in all three of the Patreon videos. I wouldn't have been able to do that normally, but um, I have been able to. And the reason there are three Patreon videos rather than two is because one, vo one video got ten and two got seven. And I suppose I could have used my own vote to go tick. You've now got eight. But that seemed a little bit dishonest. So, as there was a tie for second and third, I decided to do three as the fair way. And where else can you find me? Well, it's Twitter, AC and Naval School Naval History, uh, Patron, AC Naval History, and Glow Maritime History. And there is all sorts of stuff going on. At the moment, though, I am going to finish this quickly because I'm going to say thank you to everyone and finish it quickly because I am getting buzzed to go and record bilge pumps. Take care, thank you, and hope you enjoyed. And see you at live later. Remember, it's 6 o'clock on the British Standard Time.